Good morning. Gene Oller here with Word of Hope Church in Katie's, Kentucky. And we're glad you guys are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. And also you folks that are here in person today, God bless you for coming out and, uh, to hear the gospel. I want to encourage you guys that watch us on the internet to like and to share uh, and to comment. Send prayer requests. You can do that through private messenger. You can get in touch with us through Gene Oller, private messenger. And uh, if you need help, you need the gospel, you need prayer, let us know. We'd be glad to help you with that. Um, we're going to preach a message today called United, We Will Always Stand. United, We'll Always Stand. I think it's important for Americans to be united, for the church uh, to be united and walk in harmony and unity. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Let me encourage you to go ahead and share uh, so other people might get on. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity today, Lord, to come into your house and to share your word, Lord, to experience your presence during the song service, Lord. Uh, God, I, I could feel you and sense you, and I thank you for that, Lord. And we pray today, Lord, that you, Lord, would come down in your glory and power. Lord, that you would move mightily in our hearts and lives, that you would touch those uh, that are watching live on Facebook and those that will watch on YouTube later and then those who watch Facebook and YouTube even in the future, God. Uh, Lord, we pray that your power and presence for salvation and healing and deliverance would flow into all of our lives, God. Lord, help us, direct us, lead us, guide us by your spirit. Lord, we ask for your direction today. Lord, that Jesus would be glorified. Lord, that he would be lifted up so that all men might be drawn, Lord, to you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You might want to turn <laughs> over to Matthew 12. You might want to turn there. We're going to head that direction. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I've got a devotional book. A friend of mine, Jackie Kruger, uh, wrote, and uh, she wrote that during COVID. Gave her time, she said. And we've been on some mission trips together. It's called Manna and Miracles. And uh, I'm going to read a page out of that today. Uh, I wanted to talk about unity. And uh, I guess unity and division, they go together. And I opened that devotional. I got the book yesterday. And when I opened the devotional a little while ago, uh, she has the text that I was going to use in my sermon as the text for today, January the 17th. So... Now you might want to get a copy of this. You can get it off Amazon. And uh, that is uh, Manna and Miracles, a Daily Devotional by Jacqueline Kruger. I'm pretty sure you can find it. If not, uh, send me a message and I'll help you. Amen. I want to read out of Matthew, the 12th chapter. Uh, really tell the story. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But uh, in Matthew 12, 24, the disciples, I mean, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, the, those that were opposed to Jesus, they said this, No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. When they saw Jesus doing miracles, their response was, Oh my, he can do that because he gets his power from the devil. He gets his power from Satan and not from God. And then I'm going to read this devotional. Jesus was accused of getting his power from Satan after he had healed a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he replied, Any kingdom at war with itself is doomed. A city or a home divided against itself is doomed and cannot stand. And if, Satan's kingdom is, if Satan is casting out Satan, he is fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. Jesus said that his casting out of demons showed the supremacy, the supremacy of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of Satan. And 
You know what? If you're born again today, you're a part of that kingdom of God. And it is superior. And it is more powerful. Now, in Jesus' day, Jesus ran into lots of conflicts and, and trouble and, and struggles. The uh, religious folks of the day didn't like him very much. The Roman government probably could have cared less, but they were concerned that this man was developing a following. His theology probably did not matter to them. But the Jews were upset, and he had people following him. He was very hated. And uh, on this particular occasion, uh, he healed the man that was demon-possessed. And before that, his disciples uh, ate corn on the Sabbath day. Walking through a field, they plucked some corn off and ate that. And uh, the religious leaders suggested that quite possibly he ought to be put to death for that. <laughs> wow, how strange religion can be. How many of you know the cure to the woes in America today are not religion? They are not religion. And I'll say something else. The cures to the woes today are not politics either. Neither of them has the power to set men free. Neither of them has the power, you know, to keep going and, and bring lives out of darkness into light. Neither of them have the power to save men's souls from hell eternally. Neither of them have the truth. We may find some truth. <laughs> you know, we find some truth. We find those that have truth involved in those arenas, of course. But the Lord wants us to choose a relationship over religion. A rightness with God and God's righteousness over self-righteousness and the keeping of legal things religiously. And the church is struggling in the time that we live in. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln delivered his speech, A house divided against itself cannot stand. He gave that speech in Lincoln-Douglas debates. He said that the Dred Scott decision in 1857 had opened the door to slavery in the north as well as in all U.S. territories. This decision said that Dred Scott was not free and was not a citizen. Lincoln said, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do not expect it will, it, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. His strong anti-speech stand got him the nomination and then elected as president in 1860. And later, the Dred Scott decision was reversed by the Supreme Court of the United States. God has a plan for America. To be the home of the free and the brave. Amen. 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 America, I mean Abraham Lincoln also said in the Gettysburg Address four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty, dedicated to the ideal that all men are created equal and that we have high and that we here highly resolve that these who have died shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people and by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And then in the devotional, she offers up this prayer. Lord, we pray that our marriages, our homes, our states, our nation will be a house united in love and in truth and justice and not be a house divided against itself. Amen. I might would add to that prayer that the church would be a house unified and not divided. I, I, I talk about the local church, yeah. I'm talking about the community that we live in, churches. I'm talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, those that have been blood bought, purchased by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for us. That's how you become a part of the family of God. But Lord, in our nation, uh, guys, we understand that, that we're fractured in many ways. We're not living in the same contention of the Civil War era, but we have a lot of contention. 
And I don't know where all that could end up. I don't know. Nobody would have dreamed uh, when the Dred Scott laws were passed that the United States of America would go to civil war. And I believe, oh, I forget the numbers, but it's, I believe, a half million Americans died or wounded in that conflict among ourselves. Let me tell you this, nations typically do not rise or fall because of outside influence, but they rise or fall because the heart of its people, because the desire of its people, because people have something in mind when they come together and form a nation. They're either trying to get out from underneath something, they're trying to be free in some new way, or they're trying to find something they've not been able to find anywhere else. And a group of people become a bigger group that sometimes becomes a nation. Our nation was founded on the ideal of, of freedom, freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. <laughs> a nation where people could worship God in the way that they would see fit. Of course, one of the struggles we have today is we worship God differently. So many different brands, so many different choices. And so we find ourselves somewhat divided, especially during this past year of the COVID and political unrest and racial unrest and troubles in our nation and, and deaths and sickness and, and difficulties and loss of jobs and every other sort of loss that's come. It's been a tough year. So now we've entered this new year and, and I'm convinced this new year can be a great year for us as individuals, but I certainly cannot promise that this new year is going to be a great year for our nation, for sure. I can't promise that world condition will, go, will get better. I can't promise that COVID will end before this year is over. And uh, I would feel bad. I said that uh, several times lately, but now some of the prophets are saying that. So I'm glad they're listening to my CDs that we don't ever give out. <laughs> they must listen in the building. They are far more qualified and far wiser than I am. But nonetheless, guys, your future must be tied up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the future of our nation over 140 years ago had to find its purpose, its compass, its direction in being a nation that meant freedom for all people. And so we stand at a time when we are losing some liberties. I'm hoping that that momentum slows down. But let me tell you, that the power of Christ is too great to be stopped by the power of man. Rome tried, and they could not succeed. Paul, uh, because of religious pressure, was arrested many times, imprisoned. A lot of stuff went on in his life. But for the latter days, the last little while of his life, and I don't know, it appears he may have been in the Maritime prison twice, depending on whose expert you read. He may have been there for up to two years. He may have only been there once for a few weeks. But when he is in Rome and he's writing letters, we find out that Paul greets the people and he greets them, uh, sends greetings, not only from himself, but he sends greetings from members of Caesar's household. I want you to understand, he was either in a dungeon that was underneath Caesar's palace a palace that had been a septic tank or it was in the season that he spent where he was allowed to have his own house but was under house arrest. And I can't say for sure when those people got born again, but despite the restraints upon his life, despite living in a hostile culture, uh, despite a place where they're going to feed Christians to lions, where he himself some years before was taking the lives of believers, arresting men, women, and dare I say, the scripture says children, and hauling them off, this same man later in prison for the cause of Christ is winning people to the Lord in Caesar's household. I find that incredible. I think soldiers got born again. I think as they changed their shifts and watched that sometimes they were chained to him for shifts that he shared the glorious gospel. I want you to understand that Jesus did, I mean that Paul did not win people to Christ with cunningly devised speeches. Nor did he lead people to Christ with elegant speech. Neither did he win them to Christ uh, through the philosophies of this world. 
We see that when he was in Athens, he debated with them along those lines, and it did not go well. And then in the next writing, he writes, I did not come to you with the power of excellent speech, but I came to you with power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit of God. If you're born again today and Christ dwells in you, his spirit dwells richly in you, you have everything you need to change the world wherever you go. It is within your mouth to share the glorious gospel of Jesus. But the church has to be unified in that cause. It is the greater cause above everything else it is that we demonstrate lives that represent Jesus well in our generation. In our generation. We have to reach young people by respecting and loving and understanding there's differences and, and by caring and, and allowing them to have a voice in our lives so that maybe we could have a voice in their lives. We can't look at people that are different, whether it's ideologies or whether it's the way they look or act. I heard a minister the other day. Uh, he was on YouTube. Awesome guy. He goes around and shares the gospel. He was with people that I know of. I don't know them, but I know. And he was so awesome. And when the camera backed off, he had tattoos all the way down to his hands. Now, that did not bother me. That did not offend you. Some will remember when I came to this church in the very beginning. I said, I don't care if people come with pink hair, body piercings, or tattoos all over. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's a man that got born again, and he doesn't look the part to some. But how many of you know in the eyes of Jesus, he is precious. And in fact, he is powerful because he has a global ministry sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And I've heard this man speak on several occasions. I just never saw his uncovered arms. I didn't realize he was covered in tattoos. And once again, I want to make it clear, does not bother me in the least. I have tattoos myself. Just didn't have enough money for more ink before I uh, got born again and quit fooling with that stuff. Amen or old me? Just quiet. <laughs> Lord, we don't know what to think about you sometimes. Amen. United, we will always stand. Jesus taught that lesson in the devotional that we read. When we come together and we agree together and we work together, we become more powerful. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. When there are two walk together, uh, one can help if one stumbles. You see, the body of Christ is just that. We are a body. and Maybe we will read that scripture in just a little bit. Amen. Let me move a little further down here in these notes. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. The scripture tells us about Jesus in Matthew 12. It said, he shall not strive. This is the servant of the Lord that's come to bring judgment to the Gentiles. In other words, he's come into the world to share the gospel with the Jews and the Gentiles. He said, it's not my time yet for them, but he calls us to carry that message. And even when he was on the earth, he never turned one down. He healed uh, non-Jewish people when they came and asked. But it says, he will not strive nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break. Smoking back shall he not quench. Till he shall send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So Jesus is describing. He's fulfilling a prophecy of who he is. And what he's come to do. And his kingdom is powerful. But it's not with striving. It's not with fighting. It's not with physical conflict. It's not with attacking other people and who they are. No, it's a different kind, a different kind of kingdom. I had written uh, that uh, in the, even in these times or in the last days, there's going to be a great shaking, a great shaking going on. How many of you might think that the institutions and the foundations and the finances and other areas of America might be going through a testing, a trying, or a shaking at this time. Even our democracy may be going through some sort of shaking and trying times. I'm sure we would agree. Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. Church buildings are not the answer. Now, I'm, I'm a church guy. How many of you know that? I go to church all the time. When I got born again, I went every day but Monday. It's been my habit all my life to be a frequent attender to church or Bible study or 
small gatherings. I like God's stuff. And I like to witness and share the gospel. It's hard, but I still do that. Uh, we're living in a time that is difficult. I love church, but people don't need our religious views. They need the love of God that's been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit, expressed through our words and actions. And let me tell you when it's expressed best is when things are not going our way, when people are not for us, when it's a struggle, and we still act right. We still demonstrate Christ's love towards those we don't agree with. We still show mercy when it's a tough time. We show kindness when people are not treating us kind. We show love when they're smothering us with anger. We stand fast on the love of Christ. David Wilkerson, how many of you remember him? Went to be with the Lord a few years ago, and I got saved through his ministry, Teen Challenge, in 1974. David Wilkerson, when he went to New York City, and if you saw the movie Cross and Switchblade, you might have seen the scene. Uh, I showed that movie, by the way, over 200 times all across Kentucky and Texas when I was with Team Challenge working on working with them. And I used to have it so memorized, it was big reel-to-reels. It was two of them. And uh, the projector, we got a good projector, a big screen we would set up, and I would start that uh, projector running, and uh, I, I would get, uh, you know, bored with the movie, and I would want to pray in the spirit and pray, and so uh, not a good idea. I always had somebody, I said, come get me if we got trouble, and I would walk out in the parking lot and walk around praying that people would get saved, praying that their hearts would be touched, and I could be doing that, and then in my mind, I would begin to say the words of the movie, and I'd come inside, and I'd be right on the word. I'd be right on what I saw it so many times, I knew that I had about 45 seconds to the end of the first reel. And I'd come in and walk in and reach over. And many times, I hit, we had to actually stop it back then. We didn't have two projectors synced together. And we didn't have PowerPoint machines and, and DVDs. We had eight tracks <laughs> and big movie reels. And I put that other one on. In that movie, if you've seen it, uh, Nikki Cruz comes up smacks David Wilkerson in the face as hard as he could. And yep, that hurt. <laughs> oh, David had the grace of God, but it hurt. <laughs> it really hurt. And uh, David, I mean, Nikki Cruz said, I'm going to kill you. And Nikki had a knife. And David Wilkerson said to him, if you cut me up in a thousand pieces, they will all cry out. I love you, Nikki. I love you, Nikki. I wonder where David Wilkerson learned that from. I wonder what gave him that sort of inspiration. I wonder what possessed that man's soul to leave a comfortable little church in Pennsylvania and go and live on the streets. Yes, he lived in his car for quite a while, witnessing on the streets of New York City. His church didn't like it. Other folks didn't like it. It was tough. He had a wife, and I think they may have had a child. Oh, my goodness. What compelled that man to do that? Why did he do that? Was he foolish? Was he ridiculous? Was he unrealistic? Or was he a man possessed with God? And he followed a Savior who so loved the world, God sent his son to die for us. And he followed the example of Christ who was being crucified, loving the very people that were murdering him. God, give me that kind of love. Colossians tells us to live a crucified life, to be crucified with him. Nevertheless, it's not I that lives, but Christ that lives through me. Jesus said, deny ourselves and pick up a cross and follow him. Are we really willing to do that? Am I willing to do that? Or have we gotten so comfortable and cushy and things so well off and coming together so good and we get so much, we have so much that we've lost sight of our greater need, Christ, and winning the world. These are difficult times. The church is going through pretty hard division. People are saying things people don't like, and we don't need to condemn our brothers and sisters. We may not agree with everything, and they may not agree with us, and they might be more right than I am. I don't know sometimes. But nonetheless, the church ought to love its own and love the world. By this, Jesus said, shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. He actually was talking inner circle to the disciples. Now that didn't mean we don't love the world. We're called to that. 
We need to love each other. Luke 21, 26 talks about the hour that we may be in. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The times of shaking are used by God to dispose, to expose when we're dependent upon anything else but him. You understand that? The times of shaking that come in our lives or in this world are used by God to expose our dependence upon other things instead of Him. God wants you and I to be wholly dependent upon Him, completely trusting in Him. He wants all your eggs in that basket, so to speak. He wants you to be on that limb alone with Him, cutting it off. For his glory. Let me tell you. If we pray only when all else fails. Then God is willing. That all would fail. So that we would pray. I want to say that again. How many of you know that's the saying people have. Well if all else fails we'll pray. Well guess what. A lot's failing. So we'll see about that won't we. I think America has prayed more in the last six months than has prayed in a long time. Thank God for that. But it prayed because of controversy, because of struggles, because of conflict. If we pray only when all else fails, then God is willing that all would fail so that we would pray. Somebody might say, has it come to that? Maybe. Maybe it has. Maybe we could... Avoid some things by praying in advance. My YouTube message last night, or Facebook, I'm sorry, was uh, praying for prevention. We could pray on the front end of things. We could pray on the front end of things. Our world's being shaken. A lot of things that we had our hope and confidence in, a lot of people that we look to, maybe we find ourselves having difficulty with. Maybe we're struggling with these things. Satan, after Jesus had fasted 40 days, came and tempted him. And one of those temptations uh, was to give him the kingdoms of the world. And it says in Luke 4, 5, that the devil, taking Jesus up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, I'll, I'll give you those kingdoms if you'll bow down and worship me. I'll give you those kingdoms. The shortcut, the shortcut to the will of God. Jesus came to take back those kingdoms. And someday, Revelation tells us, he will rule over the kingdoms of this world. But he came to die. He came in a season of the gospel being released from the Jewish nation to the entire world. He had a higher purpose than what was going to be easiest or more comfortable for him, what would work out best for him during that time. He wasn't interested. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You see, the folks that don't know Christ have been blinded, and we are the light. They've been blinded, and we are the light. But the light is Christ through us. That's the hope of glory for the world. The light is Jesus living in me and through me for his glory. This light reveals Christ and his Father. And he's trying to keep people from seeing the light. I want to tell you this. There is no light outside of God's people. You understand that? We are the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But when he got ready to go, he said, now you're the light of the world. I remember uh, Bill Johnson said one time, paraphrasing that. He said, you know what? I'm the, he said, Jesus said, paraphrasing. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he went, tag, you're it. And that's where we are. We're it. He's gone and he wants to shine through us. We don't have to shine. He wants to shine through us. We have to yield ourselves. We have to yield ourselves. Revelations 11, 15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. There's coming that hour and that time 
when this kingdoms of the world, everything is going to fall under the supreme lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not seeing that in our world today. We're in that time when men are lost. Most people in the world today are lost. I could not really know numbers for sure. Nobody could. We're approaching 8 billion people on the planet. They say over 3 billion have never heard the gospel. 2 point some billion have never heard the gospel. And another couple of billion have never heard an adequate explanation of the gospel. They've been told something about Jesus in the Bible, but, but they don't have enough information. Our work is not done. We have a job to do. You do, I do, we all do. It is the winning of the lost. It's giving our lives so that others might live. It's laying our lives down in the church when it's unified in that cause and purpose certainly will make the greatest difference. More people will come to Christ. We'll see more good done. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Will somebody say, oh me, or oh my, or that's right, Pastor? Or just be quiet. Yeah, it's funny. If I'm doing a Bible study, tell people to be quiet. They get up and start talking. <laughs> be quiet. Don't say anything, guys. Shh. <laughs> Sleep on, my little ones. That's what Jesus said. He wanted his disciples to watch and pray and the third time as they go on to sleep. I'm about to hit them. Hit the end of the road in just a minute. They're coming to get me. Yeah. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.2 says, talking to believers, the Apostle Paul writing, Don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. The shaking is going on in the church, out of the church, in our political world, in our, in our nation, in every area. Most of what affects America doesn't affect all of us, but the things that we have going on today are affecting all of us, whether it's COVID or the political issues, whether it's the struggles in the body of Christ, whether it's, you know, the struggles that people are living under such stress that marriages are failing at a higher rate, crime rate is up higher, murder is up higher, drug addiction is on the increase. I mean, this is something that is changing our world and we're right here in the middle of it. You are the light of the world. Hebrews 12, 27 says, and this word, this word, the word of God, but this word yet more, yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which may not be shaken, cannot be shaken, may remain. So let me paraphrase that. The shaking, when it goes on, when God shakes things, uh, it's going to shake loose the stuff that is not firmly attached. It's going to shake off that that's not deeply rooted in the Lord, in the love of Christ, in the Word of God. The shaking separates believers from church attenders. The shaking separates devout religion from true relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're living in a time shaking. What's Jesus all about? The other day I read you some of the first words of Jesus in the Gospels, and I'll refer to a little bit of that right now. But uh, the very first words of Jesus recorded in the Scriptures, the very first words that he said in the Scriptures is found in Luke. Um, and I, I think that it's uh, chapter 2. I left off that thing just like I did the other day, Luke 2. And he said to them, to his parents, they had, they had lost him. And, uh, you know, how many of you know that's kind of hard to explain to God at devotion time tonight? By the way, Jesus is missing. I don't know what happened to him. Joseph was supposed to keep hold of him. <laughs> I would think Mary would have said, yeah, we always blame somebody. He said to his parents, when he was 12 years old and separated for three days, they found him in the temple. Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement he spoke to them. I must be about my father's business. Wow. Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse 15. 
tells us about the business that Jesus came for. In the land of Subulon and in the land of Nittali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is that's the Father's business, to bring men and women and boys and girls to a place of repentance. Why? Because God's kingdom is at hand. Luke 19, 10, and you all know this, of course, but it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Why did he come? What was the overall, overriding purpose of Christ to come? To seek and save those which was lost. Not just physically the ones he would encounter, but going to the cross. Jesus' last words before taking up into heaven, after his resurrection, he's leaving the world in Acts 1, 6. Therefore, when the Lord had come together, they asked him, saying, Jesus, when, when, when will be the time that you will restore the kingdom of Israel? How many of you know that many times we're concerned about our group? They weren't concerned about the world, although he kept preaching about the world and Gentiles. When are you going to restore our kingdom? When are we going to get uh, you as Lord and we're going to rule and reign with you? They were asking. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put into his own authority. Uh, there's a lot of things, folks, Jesus was telling them, that's not for you to know right now. But there is something that needs to have the preeminence in your life. There is something that needs to drive you and motivate you. And I say it's the truth for us today. And he said this. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You see, that's the call. To be empowered by a spirit to be a witness to carry the gospel. That's the important business of the body of Christ. You know, we look at uh, Matthew 28 uh, in the Great Commission. And Jesus said, I have all power and authority. You go, therefore, into all the world. Baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything, everything that I've commanded you. There's a lot of things about Christianity that we're more interested in than that. Whether it's the Bible studies we attend or certain areas of prophecy that we like to study or, or just other areas of Christianity that are good and fine, they're biblical, they're a part of our lives. But this area of the responsibility that we have of sharing the gospel with people at every possible opportunity, we struggle with that, and so do I. I don't do it near enough, even though I do it routinely, not near enough. I prayed the other day with a telemarketer. There were people in the building. They stopped to listen while I talked to Mr. Spam Risk. That was his name, and I began to talk with him, and I addressed him as Mr. Risk. <laughs> And I kept him on the line. And before it was over with, I was able to pray with him. No, he did not receive Christ, but I was able to pray with him. Now, lest you think I'm boasting, I'm thinking of the goodness of God that touched that man's heart. I'm reminded of the IRS lady that, that began to weep and cry and said, don't stop. I'm reminded of somebody that couldn't have children and was struggling in Florida that I had to call about a medical bill for my, one of my daughters and was paying that bill. And we prayed for her reminded of dozens of other business phone calls where after they talk, then I talk, share Jesus because we showed respect and listen. Uh, do they hang up? Oh, yeah. Most of them hang up. <laughs> it turns out they already know Jesus and they're going to go share him with somebody else, I guess. But uh, there are dozens and dozens and dozens the last couple of years. How many of you saw the post on Facebook? People copy me sometimes. And it said, now that I'm getting a little bit older, I never say that part. But I'm so glad that I have people that are concerned about me. And I get calls every day nearly uh, wanting to know about my car's warranty. Amen. How many of you get those calls? <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. I say, you know, I get calls, people concerned about my health. I can remember years ago when people were trying to hurt my health. But I get calls now from complete strangers wanting me to get a back brace if I need it. In fact, they want me to get the back brace if I don't need it. Isn't that nice? 
and people concerned about my 20 year old cars, car warranty. They always, say, when I tell them that, they say, do you have a newer car? And I say, no, but let me tell you what I got. They usually hang up, but occasionally I get some of them. People concerned about my Medicaid, Medicare, and people concerned about, you know, what supplement program I'm going to buy. And I mean, I get calls from all kinds of people. America does have a nice caring side, amen? Those are people that God sends your way that you can talk to about Jesus sometimes. Wow. Well, what about the church? Is the church meant to be powerful? Is the church, what, what, what is this church, this body of believers that Christ made us a part of? We're to receive power. We're to fulfill his mission to seek and save that which is lost. He came with a purpose to die for others. And we're called to pick up our cross and follow him that in the lives of most of the disciples and millions of others have led to their death. Amen? Oh, me. I've been privileged to stand with the knife to my throat and refuse to stop preaching. And I pray God would give me courage if I ever face that. Or God give me courage if I would face imprisonment and there go through things that many of my brothers and sisters some of which I've had the privilege of meeting and hearing their stories. Others I read about them in a book and found out, oh my goodness, that's the man I had lunch with a month ago. Did not realize. He never told us. Whoa, stories. But then I read about him later. Yeah. Jesus talks about the church in Matthew 16. And right after uh, uh, verse 16, 16, we'll just start here. Simon Peter answered the Lord because Jesus said, uh, whom do men say that I am? And then who do you think I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, blessed are thou, Simon, for flesh and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, that you are, I tell you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Some translations say, Peter, thou art the rock. But uh, in some translations, thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. Either way is fine, and we'll define that in a second. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you think the gates of hell prevailed in the Garden of Gethsemane? When Jesus suffered. Do you think the gates of hell prevailed in Pilate's Hall and in the pictorial? And when he stood before Herod, do you think the gates of hell prevailed? Now, they might have thought so, you understand. They might have thought so. They might have thought, yeah, yeah. At the whipping post, when Satan and the powers of darkness are crying out, hit him again, hit him harder. Don't you imagine that's what they did? You think hell was silent? They were raging as they thought they were seeing the defeat and destruction of the Son of God. But I promise you, they did not gain an inch. He suffered, but they did not win a victory. He bled, but they lost. In the Via Della Rosa, did he suffer loss there? No, he did not. Did hell gain something? They thought so. I all the time wonder, you know, the man that carried the cross, his grandson is referred to in the scripture. Did you know that? Yeah, that man is referred to later, a son, a grandson of the man that carried the cross because he got born again. Not all time thought. I wonder if there was any conversation down that two-mile road of that man carrying the cross with Christ. Certainly, he was blood covered from Christ. His face rubbed on the same wall spot on a wooden cross that Jesus' face rubbed. His shoulder and back, the same splinter. How many of you know the cross was not a pretty piece of highly polished, satin finished polyurethane decoration? This was a rough piece of tree that may have been used 50 times before. Splintered, tearing the flesh. And this man had to carry the cross with Christ. Apparently, something got on him and something got eaten. Because his family later was identified as believers in this New Testament. You see, this church that Jesus talked about is a church so powerful 
that the gates of hell could not prevail. It doesn't mean that it doesn't look like the gates of hell are prevailing. It doesn't mean that it doesn't look like all hope is lost. It doesn't mean that it doesn't look like the church is done for or the believer's not going to make it or the Bible's going to disappear or there won't be any more Christians. It doesn't mean that at all. Now, it may mean some struggle and some suffering, some difficulties and hard times. How many of you know that is in the Bible? I mean, we, don't, we act like we don't think the New Testament's got any of that, but it does have some of that. And oh, how I wish our lives would just be silver lined, filled with gold, and every day just glorious. But if I have to choose, if it takes the loss of something to make me value what I have in Christ, then I welcome. I'd rather suffer and know him better than to live in luxury and know him less. Paul penned that, did he not? That I might know him and become conformed to his suffering. That I might suffer with him, Paul said. And he was suffering and asking for more, that he might know him better. This kingdom, powerful kingdom, the rock, of course, is Jesus. He's the foundation. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you ask shall be bound on earth, and whatever you loose shall be loose on uh, bound. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. This came through the revelation of the fathers of Peter. Peter was a part of that church. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you're no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's who you are if you're born again. And you've been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, those who went before us, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, our Lord and Savior. Verse 21 and 22 says, In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What he's talking about there is you and I becoming the body of Christ. Yeah. Remember that little thing? I don't remember the little point, but there's the church and there's the steeple. Open doors and look inside and there's the people, something like that. Interlocked. We are the body of Christ inseparably from our Lord. I mean to tell you what, we could stand through thick and thin. Uh, through thick and thin, we're conquerors, we're overcomers because of what he did, not because of who we are. Not because we're strong, but because we stand on the strong foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We stand on the blood of those who went before us, on the martyrs, on that seed that Jesus said, except a grain of seed fall into the ground and die, it remaineth alone. But if it dies, it comes back up and reaps a great harvest, produces a great harvest. That's what we're called to I want to say today, as we head towards closing, go to where the battle is. One of the prophets, a great guy, preached a message. Uh, well, he's the pastor of uh, uh, Brother Copeland's church, Eagle Mountain. Oh, no, it was a visitor. <laughs> anyway, it was somebody somewhere preached. Good message. I listened to it. Run to the roar. And uh, that's an interesting message. Run to the roar. But go to where the battle is. You know, Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God and putting on the armor of God. I, I want you to see something about the armor of God. He tells us to put it on and stand. That's interesting. Stand. That, that, that is our position. We stand for the word of God. We stand for the things of God. We stand for the cause of Christ. Now that doesn't mean we don't walk anywhere. Doesn't mean we don't move anywhere. But our Lord talked about a church that was so powerful, his church, that the gates of hell could not hold it back. And, and the purpose of assaulting the gates of hell is to keep men and women and boys and girls from going there eternally. Amen? To keep people out of that place. And so we put on all the armor of God. But then he tells us how it all works. And that is in Ephesians 6 verse 18. Praying always for all, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. All of that armor has a purpose. Prayer is how we connect to the general. But this armor, 
this perseverance that we have is so that we pray for the saints. That's part of it. So that we remember that we're all in this war and we pray for one another in unity. We come together realizing that we have a cause that is so great that we put on the army of God and the uh, armor of God and we stand against the wiles of Satan. That we lift up a voice that we become the light of the gospel. And what do we do? A whole lot of our prayers. Here he says, what are we going to do? We're going to pray always for all saints. Do you understand? It's tied together. But... Uh, praying for all saints, that means the ones we don't see eye to eye with. That means the factions and the place of disunity in the body of Christ. We pray that we might come together. Many would say, well, Pastor, you don't work well with other people yourself. Yes, I struggle with that. But boy, I try to overcome it. And I'm working on it. Pray for me, all the saints that will do a better job. And secondly, Paul said, and for me, that the utterance may be given unto me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Do you understand that the armor of God is put on so that we would pray one for another and that we might boldly open our mouths to preach the gospel? Isn't that what Jesus said? You'll be a dude with power to be a witness for me. That wasn't for some. All 120 went to the upper room. They all got that. You see, we're a part of a kingdom. We're a part of an army, but it is not a violent army. It doesn't win with screaming words and raging tempers. It doesn't, rain, it doesn't uh, pour out the wrath of God upon other people. It stands in love and mercy and truth. It is a kingdom where when we are smacked and our lives are threatened, like David Wilkerson, we say we're going to love you anyway. It is a kingdom where we love those that despitefully use us and say all manner are evil about us. It is a kingdom where we model forgiveness and love and mercy to those who don't know anything about that and dish out everything but that. Ours is not a kingdom of people that are bitter and unhappy, that are discouraged and defeated. Ours is a kingdom of joy-filled overcomers that are striving or yielding that the fruit of the Spirit might be manifest in our life, that our character would be different and we would look different than the people of this world in such a way that they might ask the reason for the hope that is in us. Yeah, our kingdom is a kingdom of love. We talk about that. We won't go there today. Man, that word is used a lot. Real biblical kind of love. There's a quote here I want to read by Napoleon Bonaparte. He said, Alexander, Caesar, and Charlemagne all have found kingdoms. But what did we rest all of our creation and genius upon? Upon force. But Jesus Christ has in, empowered his kingdom with love. And at this very minute, millions of men would die for him. Ours is not a revolution of violence. Ours is a revolution of love and mercy and forgiveness and grace. No, we don't go along with everything that comes along, but we still love. We still demonstrate Christ. Jesus demonstrated and shows us over and over through his life and the lives of the disciples that we lay down our lives for the cause of Christ to reach other people. That all men might know that we're disciples because of our great love for each other. Finally, the last scripture, Psalms 133. David said, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even as Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The blessing of God is found in unity in the body of Christ. It doesn't mean we like passion. It doesn't leave, mean that we like fire. It's just that our passion is for the souls of men and our fire is to warm the hearts of those that do not know him, that they might be convicted through our acts of love and mercy. I would go on and talk about good works, the Salvation Army, and the things they do, and the call that God gave us to pray for the sick, to visit the sick, and those that are 
homeless and in prison and suffering, to help the widows, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to meet needs of humanity. That's the call of the believer. Call of the church, but it's the call of us as individual believers. When you see a need, meet it. When you have an opportunity, love somebody. Love somebody. What if they don't accept it? Love them anyway and go on. Don't try to make them. <laughs> don't fight with them about it. They don't want it. Move on. But love them. Make sure they know that you love them. And you go. And tell them the reason for the love is because of who Christ is in and through you. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word today. It is powerful. My preaching and teaching, we, but your word, powerful. And that's why we use so many scriptures. Lord, help us to realize we are in a kingdom and we are in a battle and we are in a war. And we live in times that are being shaken and some things are falling apart and some things, Lord, are being shaken out because they're not really in your kingdom. Lord, I pray this would be the eye that we would sure up our relationship with you. That this would be the season that we would recommit, restart our lives in you. That we would dedicate ourselves to knowing you through the word of God knowing you through daily, frequent prayer life, knowing you through acts of service and love for humanity, knowing you through allowing your Holy Spirit to develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Lord, that this would be a time when we share the gospel like never before, not for response or approval, but for the love of souls, for the love of the Father. We thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you guys for joining us today here at the church as well as on YouTube and Facebook. And I encourage you on Facebook and YouTube, if I can help you, get in touch with me. Be glad to pray with you or talk with you. God bless you.